but then would be remediated um, partially using mushrooms to then the garden <laughs> I showed you. What kind of mushrooms? Yo, this is where the, the chairman of the Multnomah County Democratic Party has given up his 50 by 100 lot to create a food forest for his community, including gathering places and timber bamboo for building. This is the design office where I work most days called Community Architecture. This is a local microclimate with 84 varieties of edible plants, including peaches, apples, pears, Asian pears, cherries, almonds, grapes on solar trellises, boysenberries on the trellises, artichokes, potatoes, tomatoes, flowers, asparagus, and this is our traffic calming strategy. Don't park in the grass strip here because of these stinging nettles that will consume your car. <laughs> This has nothing to do with affluence. It's what you got and how you and whether or not you want to share it. This is the most low-income community in the city, taking back their courtyard, which was just concrete, creating a place to play, a handball court, mur murals, more fruit trees, and a barbecue pavilion, micro infill co-housing where everyone owns their own house and they cooperatively own all the paths and gardens and community tea house. No parking required because it's within 500 feet of a transit street. No parking required anymore in Portland, Oregon, if you're within 500 feet of a bus. Bicycle pieces being incorporated in the solar trellises and in the gables. The most fabulous building, I think, in the universe made entirely out of trash and natural materials. Um, a parking lot that drinks rainwater. So much to say about this, but the coolest thing is that everyone who works here has power in the organization. They help to guide it. They all get a living wage. Their entire families get full benefits. And what they do is take trash and alchemize it to make it more available for the community to come and get for pennies on the dollar. Natural light and heat streams into the building through these recycled windows. You come inside to find all kinds of things you want to take home to work with. This is the main pedestrian entry, 44 cubic yards of cob. I think it's the third permitted cob structure in the country, commercial structure. When you look up, these fabulous trees that spell out the four seasons up above you out of recycled metal. We knew by the time we got to 11 or 15 of these projects, they would start to happen. Like, we're not just talking about like natural building and permaculture. That's happening already, but merging with civic participation in the urban context to subvert the whole context of isolation to join with urban design and all these other disciplines. So here's a full vision plan, a 20 year vision plan for a town on the Oregon coast that is now fully underway. A town that thought that all of the pieces were separate and nothing would relate. Suddenly woven together by linkages, honoring archeological sites, building places for kids, the first public square intersection interventions throughout the fabric, ways to get them across the highway that cut them off from the bay, all sorts of wonderful initiatives for restoring the ecology of the bay, the first public square, the community center. But the first thing they did was took the Masonic Lodge and turned it into an art center for which to organize the rest of the vision. Seattle, more than a few times. Olympia, Washington, more than a few times. Eugene, now in the center of the city. Los Angeles, of course you've got to have giant floating angels in the streets of the city of the angels with crosswalks that spell out welcome in Korean and Spanish and English and three swirling waves of water going down the three intersection street, intersecting streets and this kaleidoscopic wheel in the center. Duluth, Minnesota, is it a good idea for this little girl to take back the streets and ask you to slow down or for this boy to paint a kaleidoscopic heart and remind you of love? Minneapolis, Tucson, Ottawa, Ontario, and so many other cities, I don't even know anymore. Starhawk is now taking the fifth sacred thing and turning it into a movie and we're fortunately getting to help her with the storyboarding. This is a power down scenario where we do not die, we survive the power down of peak oil. The streets become gardens again, community gathering places, the tops and sides of buildings feature all kinds of gardens and trellises with fruit bearing vines and trees. The streets become places for markets again. And then believe it or not, the 2010 Olympics called and they're like, we're talking, we can't build white elephants anymore. We need an ecological expression that is a reflection of the community. Can you help us? And we're like, all it is about is helping you guys listen to yourselves to figure out how to make a reflection. So Canadians, of course, would say a world-class skating rink that needs to look like a pond or a sacred, like a sacred island with a stream around it. Like that's how we grew up as Canadians, skating on open bodies of water. The columns need to look like trees that reach up and touch the floating flames of the roof that resemble clouds. Breath, the air is there for you. The gravity holds you together. Your friends are there in case you start to stumble. 
The great cartoonist Andy Singer came to Portland and he did this cartoon and he said, oh, I, okay, I see. It used to be like this and now it's going to be like this. This is the before and this is the after. And in the before, even the dogs were bummed out. People, <laughs> people would walk in the streets going, oh, my experience of isolation, it's so unique. I'm so alone. <laughs> no, that's not the case. This is our timeless destiny. No matter what form it takes, it's not about painting the streets or the benches where we sit or the tweaked up fire hydrants or, 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 or stop signs or kiosks. Like all that's just stuff that reflects us. This is a catalyst that sends you out powerful into the rest of your life, your daily life and what else, whatever else you'll do with other people. More powerful to make decisions and have courage or to connect with other people and join your energies and not feel so alone. This is a momentary interlude in the history of humanity that will be transcended and forgotten. Especially when, I know this, because I've seen people go from taking the streets and having the courage to do it illegally, and changing the rules, changing the laws, and the systemic transformation of the civic leadership and the, the bureau, bureaucracy across the, across the spectrum of the city of Portland that is now helping bureaucracies in all of these other cities undertake this as well. And the way that we did it was we refused to submit to this absurdity and we kept talking to people as if we respected them and we shared in this same dignity. And when they said, you can't do that, we have the power, you don't, we said, like, like we were Jedi Masters kind of, we said, everyone needs a public square. And they were like, oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> when you see your neighbors come together and fall in love in the streets and stand up and declare their love and get married, and all these other neighbors, hundreds of them sitting in concentric circles, standing up and reading poetry and prose and saying, we love you, we're villagers together here with you, the streets becoming sacred, some great paradox of the Roman Empire is being overturned. 11,000 grid cities were built, designed to isolate people and, and turn them into these producers to feed the empire, while the empire said, love your neighbor. Indigenous wisdom, any indigenous grandmother would say to you, love your neighbor, duh. What about a resilient, interconnected web of relational networks that will endure through time in which we see ourselves as interconnected with all life forms around us and create an economy of love that compels us through our enjoyment of being alive, you know? What about that? Not just merely aspiring to love. Here you see people loving each other in the streets, overturning that ancient paradox. It's about so much more than just love. And then it happens again, and again, and again. Here's one of the most conservative men in the entire United States, the Chamber of Commerce president from Cincinnati, Ohio, holding hands, doing this ancient European circle spiral dance, and at the end of the dance, he comes up to the bride and groom with tears streaming down his eyes, and he says, I realized that it doesn't matter. Like, we all have the same God, no matter what metaphor we use or what we call it. So Frank Lloyd Wright was quite an ego guy, but he loved the world and his country. I'm going to quote his teacher, who he loved so much. Louis Sullivan, who Frank Lloyd Wright called the master teacher, he's the guy that said form follows function, except he meant the form of beauty and love and living. He said this, and I totally believe him, it is the destiny of all people to create a fit, abiding place, a safe and beautiful world. On behalf of City Repair in Portland, thanks for bringing me all this way. <laughs>